off with just a little bit of intro about the, the host organization for Ross Industrial Americas. Um, and then as I was putting this presentation together, I was reflecting a little bit about uh, the history of the consortium. So I'll talk about, you know, maybe our foundational starting point. Sometimes, you know, we've been going for 10 years. Sometimes we, it's fun to reflect on how did we get this all started. Um, so let me kick this off with just first uh, a message about Southwest Research Institute, the facility that you're at here today. Um, we are an independent, not-for-profit research and development firm, and we focus in applied research development technology and engineering. Um, we have about 3,000 people here. Most of us are here on this campus that you see in the screen, and our mission is that we're, we're essentially committed to advancing science and applying technology for the benefit of government industry, and I know this is very lofty, but all of humanity, and Ross Industrial uh, being an open source software uh, program is one of those uh, elements that fits our mission. Um, so we're happy you're here. Uh, if you need anything while you're here, please let us know. Um, I guess we could cover a couple of safety topics for those that are here in the room. Clearly the exit signs are marked uh, at the exits, and if you go out this door, you can go right out to the back of the building. Go out this door, you can go right out the front, so you you're, you're uh, have a quick access to uh, some, some exit points. Um, otherwise, if you need anything while you're here, we have people in the lobby that are supporting the event, too. If you need a breakout area or something, please let us know. Um, but welcome. So I want to introduce uh, Jerry Towler for a few minutes. He's going to talk just briefly about robotics at Southwest Research Institute. He leads the, the entirety of our robotics portfolio here at Southwest Research Institute. And um, wanted him to just get up and say a couple of, of words about uh, what is the vision for uh, robotics at Southwest Research Institute and, and maybe how Ross Industrial fits into that. So, Jerry, over to you. Hey, good morning. They didn't mic me up, so I have to stand in one place. Uh, so I apologize that I don't get to be super dynamic and pointing at the screen. Melissa also told me I'm not allowed to touch the screen, so I will just point and you guys will have to kind of oh. figure it out. No, I'm not actually going to point. This is a joke. <laughs> We're trying to introduce this with a little bit of levity because everybody is just barely having coffee and breakfast. My name is Jerry Towler, and I am the Director of Robotics for SWERI, and I'm very glad that you all are here. Some of you all here on campus, some of you all here online, some of you all listening to this years and years in the future, going back to figure out where we were 11 years into this or whatever. Um, and uh, our, our vision here is to meet the SWERI vision. The Institute's vision here is, as Paul said, to benefit humanity through the application of science and technology from deep sea to deep space. Our president is really into making sure that we are a comprehensive research and development organization. And that there are not domains where we say, nah, we don't want to do any of that. As you can see, we've done some work in the robotics sector in the past, and that's our goal for robotics into the future. We want to be the world's most comprehensive robotics department. That is, not that we necessarily do everything, but that we have the capacity, the capabilities, the facilities, the expertise to answer any of the challenges that are brought up by y'all, by your member organizations, uh, and by the clients that come to the Institute. So very briefly, looking at kind of what we're seeing here, you're seeing things that move from the very small to the very large. You're seeing things that move from ground to air. And we have, in the last year, expanded from ground to air also into sea and space within the robotics domain. Uh, these are kind of really important focuses uh, for us, not, again, necessarily because you have to do everything, but because you want to be able to do anything. Uh, and that's really our target here. So I hope you all have an excellent day. I hope that you see some of the cool stuff going on. Uh, as you're walking around to some of the demos that I know some of the organizations here are doing uh, today and tomorrow, I hope you take the opportunity to ask some questions about not only the technology, but also some of the facilities here. Uh, I think that you'll see that um, we're able to do a lot of cool things, and hopefully we can do some cool stuff together. I appreciate the time. Back to Paul. Great. Thanks, Jerry. So um, what I want to do next is, uh, as I mentioned earlier, a little reflection. Um, I was looking through some things last night when I was thinking about what I'd talk about, and um, I don't want to bore you, but I also want to reflect on how uh, some of our roots. So. Uh, this picture on the far right is actually the proposal that we wrote to uh, our advisory committee for research. Um, and this idea was, what if we have somebody go out to this company called Willow Garage and take a Motoman robot out there and see if we can get it working with Roth? That was the, that was the proposal for that. Um, and at the time, we had a couple of partners in that, one obviously being Willow Garage, uh, who was the founder of Roth 
and the other was uh, Yasukawa Moto Man. And they said, hey, take, take one of our robots out there, see what it does. Um, and we got that awarded. Well, so somebody, and, and that, uh, the reason I have that arrow pointing is you can kind of see where on Swarry campus that thought process took place in Building 68. Some people in a room thinking, hmm, what if we hook a robot up to this raw stuff? All right, so we got that done. Uh, the picture on the bottom right is at Willow Garage. Who knows, that might be Cat or Tully's office in the background, I'm not sure. But, um, but there we had uh, the motor man kind of sitting there on the floor working with Arviz. Uh, we released a press release and said, hey, we've got this repository. Now what do we do with this thing? Um, so we started reaching out and talking with industry about where do we go next with this thing called Ross Industrial, connections to industrial robotics and for the greater good of advanced manufacturing. So we said, well, we need to take a next step. Um, we think this is good. We're hearing from industry that they need this because um, we need to enable more advanced applications and capabilities for robotics. So we wrote another proposal um, and we said, hey, what if we could start a consortium around this and we build in some additional technologies and capabilities that we need for foundation of Ross Industrial. And so that's what this proposal was uh, back in August of 2012. And then we had a meeting. We had our first meeting in March of 2013. And you can see obviously here on campus where that meeting was held, which is a couple of buildings away from where we sit today. And there was our group. Um, industry leaders, um, small but, but thoughtful group on what do we do next with Ross Industrial, uh, conceiving uh, a roadmap and some strategies as to how to move forward with a consortium model. Uh, so that was March 2013. And part of that model we reflected on would be, hey, we think this would be good for a global community. So we engaged with a couple of key partners uh, Fraunhofer, EPA, and uh, Advanced Remanufacturing Technology Center. And we laid out this vision as part of that process of making sure that we had global, a global footprint for Ross Industrial. And we went from, in spring of 2020, or 2014, you see on the left, we went from a, a handful of uh, guiding, um, if you will, uh, uh, initial members, uh, fast forwarding to today, um, I think we're very close to 100. Uh, Matt probably knows the exact number, but it's, it's very, very close to 100 members today globally. Um, so we're very happy for the, the progress that we've made, for capabilities that are now in the hands of industry <clears throat> to advance the capabilities for industrial robotics. And it's supported by you all. You all are the reason why Ross Industrial exists. Um, through a vibrant community of, of developers, industry members, uh, researchers. And it only works with the collaboration that we have with you all. Uh, so this community is, is what's driving the innovation through Ross Industrial. Hats off to you all. Thank you for coming. Uh, we look forward to uh, engagement throughout the next two days. We look forward to your ideas and thoughts about how to further innovate and what you think that we should do in the next one year to three years to five years. So thank you for being here. Uh, let us know if there's anything that you need so we can make your life more comfortable while you're here. Thanks, Paul. <laughs> All right, well, thank you, Paul, for letting us know, and Jerry for taking the time to say a few words. Um, really appreciate it. And I'm gonna just intro a little bit more about Ross Industrial, kind of what we're doing. Um, so we'll just pop on over to that one. Great, so a lot of you who've been here for a few years, it's gonna be a little bit of, uh, of familiar stuff, but I did take the time to grab a little bit more recent uh, A3 data on robotic sales, and I think it's a little interesting, and I wanted to highlight some of these different trends. Obviously, we're all aware of collaborative robotics, the emergence of AI and machine learning tools uh, around perception and even motion planning and execution, um, but it's interesting to see where the difference is happening, right? When we think about it, um, obviously with the proliferation of warehouse log and logistics and obviously the drive of online ordering, particularly driven by the pandemic, well, lo and behold, right, a steady increase in material handling robot sales, right? That's very, very, very insightful and obviously sort of obvious, you know, what we've, what we've seen in the trends. Um, what we've 
also interestingly seen, it seems like robots doing new things has sort of plateaued. Now, granted, it's sort of dwarfed. These are percentages, right? So obviously, with so many more raw numbers going into warehouse logistics, um, there is more of robots doing these things. But obviously, as a percentage of total application, um, it's, it's small. <clears throat> but that just shows that there's a significant opportunity to kind of continue to enable robots to do new things. And that's, that's why we're here, right? It's one of the things we get excited about. <clears throat> So obviously, uh, for those who are new here today, I do like to preface this. We do have a couple speakers um, that will also dive a little bit more into what's going on in ROS, the robot operating system. But just to level set a little bit, right, we are talking about um, a middleware framework. I know sometimes people like our operating system. They tend to think of things like Linux or Windows. Um, but really, ROS is just a middleware framework that enables the asynchronous coordination of multiple disparate devices. Um, but it's benefit, it's not just the plumbing, right? We tend to think a lot about the plumbing, um, but it comes with the tools, out of the box capabilities, and of course, hey, we're all part of this, the ecosystem, right? So I always like to try to bring back to that. Uh, it's also not new, right? Really great track record of delivering a lot of interesting capabilities, and they're pooled um, regularly, and that's a really exciting story as well. Um, I was hoping to grab the new Jazzy artwork, right? I gave Kat a hard time yesterday about it. Um, but, but basically, we do like to sometimes talk to those who are new that, hey, ROS2 is a thing. It happened uh, a little while back. Um, and we also still support, here on the industrial side, we are still supporting users in their transition to ROS2. For some of you, that might be surprising. Uh, for those of you that have uh, been in industry a long time, uh, things that are working and not broken, uh, we tend not to mess with. Um, so we have come up with numerous strategies to support the transition, enable people to kind of like migrate at their own pace or, you know, take advantage of new features while leveraging the components that aren't broke. <clears throat> so what is ROS Industrial, right? So we tend to focus on enabling advanced capabilities in the industrial and manufacturing domains, extending the capabilities of ROS and ROS2 into those domains, uh, realizing exciting new applications. Right, that's the kind of stuff up here, uh, but also working and collaborating with OEMs on interfaces for sensors, robots, and other industrial equipment, focusing on bridges and providing other usable, usable tools such as calibration utilities to enable industrial applications. That's the Ross Industrial Project. <clears throat> Why is SWERI involved? Paul kind of talked a little bit about it, right? So SWERI was already involved in do building advanced robotic systems, right? So there was a need. Um, and there was an old, the old way of doing it, like basically coding up everything in the OEM ecosystem was painful. It made, really made it hard to leverage work if you had to, like, say, pivot from one, one set of hardware to another, right? So being where we sit as an, a not-for-profit institute um, where we just work on new problems, we're uniquely positioned to both be um, like sort of like a, uh, an even hand uh, to kind of like assist people in picking the right tools and assisting in technology transition, and that's our, our passion. <clears throat> there are challenges, though, right? And that's why we get together on a regular basis, right? And so thank you, Michael. Uh, hopefully this isn't in your slide deck. <laughs> He's speaking next. But these are a number of the different things that have been challenging. Uh, a number of you have mentioned industry adoption, and we're excited to have a number of OEMs here today, hardware providers and solution providers that are interested in, like, hey, how can we adopt? Right? Obviously, there are challenges when OEMs, particularly on the manipulator side, have propri proprietary software or just different approaches to how they enable communication with their hardware. Um, obviously, certain things can be pretty complicated. We had a workshop yesterday on SWORD, which is a tool to hopefully make things a little less complicated, but it doesn't take much to get complicated again, right? So we're constantly on that journey to improve that experience, to make the tent a little bigger for people that are more like manufacturing engineers. And these are sort of the challenges that we're working to solve. Obviously, what we do and what Ross Industrial seeks to do through a number of different venues is reach out, right? We're here, we have a number of solution providers, OEM, uh, technology developers here that we engage with on a regular basis to kind of get their voice. What are the capabilities you're looking for? Why, why are you, what, what limits you in taking advantage of the latest sensor or the latest utility or capability? Um, and that's really useful feedback for us and helps keep the thing going. And the key thing is, is to work across that global network that Paul pointed out to kind of like say really move the ball forward, right? As we make our tent bigger, our network bigger, we have a chance to do a little bit more. And that's really big for us. 
Um, not to beat it up, I won't mention the membership, but thank you all for your support, right? It keeps the repositories fresh, enables us to respond to issues, put on training, put on events like yesterday and today uh, and tomorrow. But I really wanted to touch on this, right? So we're gonna have some workshop time tomorrow to revisit this and make it a little bit more in the near term tactile, like so we can actually have some real near term actions to further um, what we're thinking about, what we're gonna try to really move towards a global roadmap this graphic has largely been America-centric. Um, we have some really exciting tasks to kind of really push and work a little bit more globally uh, to pool our resources. Um, but really the four main thrusts for Americas have been around ease of use, the capability, interoperability, and human interface reaction. And there's a little bit of activity going on in all of those. You'll see some of that in the demos uh, as you walk around this afternoon. Another thing that kind of happened that's helped us realize our ability to support those with ROS1 and ROS2 is a really push to try to make our, our capabilities uh, ROS agnostic. What that just means is that we provide the ROS1, ROS2 wrappers, but a lot of the core repositories and capabilities are, are just C++ libraries um, <clears throat> and, and, and provided like, say, with a means to be basically implemented in a, in a way of your choosing. Uh, and that's given us a little bit of flexibility, uh, particularly in supporting those who haven't quite made the push to ROS2. Um, but they can still take advantage of more recent capability. <clears throat> um, obviously, while we're here, I did want to touch on a few of these things. The other thing that the Ross Industrial Open Source Project and the Affiliated Consortium seeks to do is to bring you all together, right? So hopefully last yesterday, for those who came to the meetup, it was obviously a little bit more community-centric. You know, we want to, like, make sure that we're good stewards in our community, getting people excited about the work going on in robotics and open source and and making the tent very big. Hopefully in your regions, you see meetups around robotics happening. If you need help planning those sorts of things, we're happy to talk. Um, we're also putting them on at the Associated Big Conferences, a chance to actually talk face-to-face. -face. We also do online community meetings, obviously the training. We're engaging and trying to get feedback also from other trade associations. We have um, the Steel Founder Society of Americas here, um, and, and we've been working with the Reman Council um, and the Manufacturing Innovation Institute, thank you, Larry Sweet, he's here. Um, and so these are all great ways to have this voice of this community interact with other bigger communities to sort of like, hey, how do we work together? How do we solve these challenges in a way? Um, and when we actually get our hands dirty and work on something, I'll talk a little bit about robotic blending tomorrow, uh, which is a focused technical project. Um, you know, those are really great opportunities to really make a big push. <clears throat> Obviously, uh, some of you attended the workshop yesterday. Look at it, hot off the presses, right? So some of you, some of you in the room today were there yesterday. Uh, I, I shamelessly grabbed a picture and used it today. Um, but the workshops are a really great way to both allow you to understand the capabilities in a hands-on way, while also we get feedback, like almost instantly, right? Like, so someone's going to run into a hiccup, we'll jot that down and get to work, right? As opposed to, like, like say, you know, just something that's posted on GitHub. Um, this, like, touch point, you get to know the people that are working on the applications. We get to know your real challenges. And, of course, you get to talk amongst each other, right? And that interaction is, sort of has a lot of value. I think it's something we really missed during the pandemic time. Um, we've also been working on some other resources and references and example applications. Um, hopefully, if you have any ideas there, we'll have time Thursday afternoon to really uh, get your feedback and, and try to drive some planning around that. I did like kind of uh, mention the robotic blending. I'll be kind of like touching that in a little bit more detail in my State of the Consortium talk tomorrow. I won't belabor it. Um, but one of the really exciting parts about robotic blending was this opportunity to engage a university. So I think a model that we'd really like to replicate is this idea of enabling universities um, to contribute in a way that's a little bit more actionable out of the box. <clears throat> I think all of us have maybe run into either undergrad or grad student code, where it needs a little TLC before we can maybe drop it on an industrial robot and go grinding on something. Um, so obviously, the more we can engage universities in our kind of programs and working with our more experienced developers, that's a really great opportunity and something we'd like to do more of. So if you have ideas or universities you're already working with, we're happy to discuss like how to ramp them on. Also, if you're a Rossi member, you don't always use your training. Um, Yaskawa has had a really great model of sharing their training seats with universities that have reached out to them. That's always an opportunity. So if we have a training event coming up, you have a university student, you want to sponsor, that's always a possibility, right? So just, just shoot me a note. And I think it's really great value to expose students uh, to those opportunities. <clears throat> so I did want to touch on, like, hey, you're here. 
right? You, you, we, we're all talking to each other, sharing. A number of you already know Michael. You know, Tyler Marr is here, for instance. A number of you have met him. Um, obviously, Paul and I are happy to be sounding boards. But, like, we listen, like, right? So we were here in 2018, and there was a really big push about the easy button back. If, maybe you remember, remember the, the sticky easy button thing? I don't know if it was Staples or Office Depot. Um, anyways, I want, like, they want the easy button. So we spent a lot of time. We pitched it as a focused technical project. We had fits and starts. We made some internal pushes. And over the last year and a half, between Michael Ripperger and Jeremy Zoss, um, we now have SWORD. Um, and we had our first kind of more hands-on in-person workshop around SWORD yesterday. Um, so if you have questions about SWORD, uh, I think Michael may touch on it. Um, there, there, this is, so to speak, the, the voice we got so many times from the more manufacturing engineering-centric community, like, hey, we use CAD. Like, pit, jumping between all these open source tools is really painful. Can you help us out? Um, and so that's driven it. But obviously, we've been listening relative to, you know, improved tools to visualize toolpaths and meshes. Um, Michael's uh, done uh, just recently at a Roscon a workshop on Reach. So some of you may be familiar with Reach. Um, and obviously, the optimization-based and trajectory splicing that's shown up in tools like Tesseract. Um, those are all based on feedback from you, right? So this is how it sort of manifests itself. Uh, and hopefully we recognize that and we'll try it. If you have questions about these things that have emerged, um, I'm happy to talk with you one-on-one -on -one, or you obviously have a number of the team members here to, to talk to those about. And of course, obviously we get most excited about the fun capability. Um, the one in the bottom middle is pretty new. This is another like squeaky wheel that kind of came up for a long time uh, about coordinated motion with mobile bases that's infrastructure free. Um, and so you'll get to see this demo tomorrow. Um, but the whole idea is like, hey, without a bunch of external measuring devices, uh, a mobile manipulator can, say, apply a continuous stripe of paint beyond its reach. It can apply sealing and, of course, things like welding. Um, all these things where coordinated motion um, it is really important to the execution of processes, processes beyond the reach of a single manipulator. So we're really exciting to be able to show that. It'll be the first time it's uh, shown in front of a live studio audience. So hopefully the robot doesn't get the yips. Uh, we will see. Um, obviously, in the upper uh, right, you'll notice that's a big grinding robot with a big grinding stone and a big spindle, courtesy of our friends at PushCorp. That's at the Iowa State Lab. So one thing we really tried to do, um, one of the things that's really exciting about the collaboration with the Steel Founders was we have basically the same system that's now existing at a foundry. The same software is running at a university lab. So that's a really interesting opportunity. These grad students can, can, de can develop uh, on that system, and there's a, a little bit more I won't say perfect or efficient or clean, but at least a little bit better pathway to actually like testing it in the foundry that has the same software running, right? So we have this system running at our location here in San Antonio, at Iowa State in Ames, Iowa, and a foundry just outside of Columbus, Ohio. So that's a really interesting opportunity where we can have this basic grad students working on something that's actually running in production. And we're really excited about those types of opportunities. So again, I usually like to try to like throw this at. We try to make uh, a lot of resources available. I know this is a ton of URL links and stuff is not all in the same place. I'm open to ideas about how to make this a little bit more digestible, make it easier to find things and training resources, explainers. If you have ideas or thoughts on that, just corner me here. I'm happy to talk about it. Um, but obviously these slides will be available. Uh, I usually include a variation of this slide in every talk I give. Um, so it should be findable. Um, but if we have questions, and obviously we have a, a long in the process website revamp that hopefully will make a lot of this 